Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. Will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. Taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world. The way it was and the way it is in your memories. All right, welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast, the official podcast of the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society. This is episode 87.5, an interview with Mr. Christmas, Jim Heffelfinger. Uh, in 2002, when we did our annual holiday episode, uh, we had mentioned that we had been in touch with the person responsible for bringing the Lights of Winter display to Epcot, and we were hoping for an interview. But uh, after over a little bit over a year, Brian and I had the opportunity to talk to Jim, uh, whose 20-year career with Walt Disney World began as a stage manager at the Hoop Dee Doo Musical Review at Pioneer Hall, uh, where he met and shares a great story about our friend Billy Flanagan, uh, who attended our Retro Magic event. And uh, over the next two decades, he worked with Disney legend Ron Logan and the rest of the entertainment team to bring Christmas as we know it to Epcot, Fantasmic to Florida, the Muppets to Hollywood Boulevard, the Holidays and the Parade Animal Kingdom, and the Osborne Family Spectacle of Lights to Disney MGM Studios. Uh, Some of his shows, like Beauty and the Beast Live on Stage, are still running today, uh, much as he designed them, while others are very fondly remembered. This is a fun interview where we learn a lot, and of course, we ask for some memories of Ron Logan and Dick Nunes, invite him to a future Retro Magic event. So please enjoy this interview with one of the unsung heroes of Walt Disney World Live Entertainment, Jim Heffelfinger. Well, obviously you've heard of Gene Columbus. Mm-hmm. I had uh, been sending resumes, uh, and Gene has reached out and said, well, the next time you're in town, give me a shout and we'll hook up and Time went by and uh, finally it dawned on me, they probably get thousands of resumes a day. So I guess if I want to actually have a career there, I better get in town. So that happened um, and had a great interview with Gene. And then he said, we're not in the process of hiring right now, but we're coming up on two big projects, Pleasure Island and the studio opening uh so we'll definitely be hiring in about a year year and a half uh so stay in touch and we did over that amount of time and then uh i got a call out of the blue and the rest is history amazing and you got to work with a guy that uh we came to know and love ron logan oh yeah yep we went way back yeah, he was the VP of entertainment uh, at Walt Disney World. And actually, now that you're bringing up Christmas, it was he was uh, traveling in Europe and went to Tivoli Gardens and saw those lights there. And he came back and he said, we need to focus on that. That would make a beautiful entrance into World Showcase uh, for the holidays. And uh That's what got the whole ball rolling. It's the rumor that Walt went to Tivoli too. That's where he got some of the ideas, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's interesting. Great ideas coming from Denmark. All of the popcorn lighting (laughs) on the, on the main street buildings and all that I know was uh, something he derived from Tivoli gardens. You have been there, right? I have been there. Yeah. They have an area called world showcase, believe it or not. That's, (laughs) that's little different pavilions. It's not quite what, Epcot is, but yeah, it's a wonderful, relaxing park. Although I will say, just go off on a tangent here, it's, it's relatively inexpensive to get in, but you, if you buy a one-day pass to get on the rides, otherwise you can pay for the rides, uh, pay as you go. So my son and I rode the the very old, I forget the name of it, it's the wooden coaster that's there, that's been there over 100 years or something. Uh, I think it cost me $27 for the two of us to ride the coaster, but it was worth it. Well, but I don't now, now you know the day pass is a better deal. Exactly. Exactly. These kind of trellises or arches or whatever you want to call them are 
common in European towns as decorations, as holiday decorations? Yeah, correct. Especially Tivoli Gardens. Okay. And so to bring that, and they brought it to Disneyland Paris on Main Street and also to Epcot and World Showcase, which is what we're talking to you about. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming you guys didn't fabricate that from scratch, that it was something you were able to purchase from someone who supplied it. No, no, we fabricated them at Central Shops. Really? Yep. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, a lot that of work. blows my mind because we just operated on this uh, thought that since it's a common thing in towns throughout Europe, that there must have been a, a provider for this kind of thing. So um, someone sat down and designed this? Yeah. Um, and then we had uh, engineering figure out how to get them installed. So because of the specific nature of, you know, where they were placed on the, the walkway into World Showcase, um, you know, we had to come in and put footers in. Obviously they're very heavy, they're craned in. Each, each piece is craned in, um, but, you know, overhead safety and anytime guests are involved in anything like that, where there's something over their head. Um, so there would, Literally, especially back then, there would have been no way to purchase those outright from somewhere. Um, so yeah, the, so our entertainment engineering team um, and overhead safety uh, worked on the design and uh, we had them fabricated in central shops. And the lighting on them was anything you can tell us about them? Because it was really kind of the, not that the, uh, illuminations and laser phonics uh, fantasy before that didn't have some kind of synchronized lights but in terms of synchronized christmas lights this predated the osborne lights by a few years yep and, yeah i did that one too <laughs> and, and and so how did that come to pass like who you know who 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 brought up that wizardry there of of syncing the music and the the little things that that arch would do we worked with uh one of our entertainment lighting designers and he and i sat out there for i think it was a little over a week to to program them to the music. and it and it incorporated the tree at the end too that was one of the things right. i remember that it would sync with the with the tree for world showcase right and then this second year um i found a company i believe their name was waterworks i was racking my brain trying to think of who that was uh and then we synced up the fountains to, to the music as well, the second year. But it really was a, uh, like a, just the essence of this Christmas experience right there. It was subtle, uh, it was festive, uh, and it, it's just sorely missed by everybody. And our assumption is that they, they said it was old tech when they got rid of it. And certainly if it was custom built, I can understand them not wanting to build it again. Uh, but also, from a traffic flow standpoint, the parks are just a lot more crowded now, and I'm not sure having everybody stop to watch the arches over them light is a good thing anymore. Yeah, but at the time, people would definitely do that. It was uh, a little bit of flow. We it had um, op spokes out there trying to channel them down the sides so people could stand in the main thoroughfare um and, and watch them for as long as they wanted now the year they were introduced they were part of uh, it was really a large transformation because epcot had had precious little uh christmas stuff in it there were bits of decorations around and all but the the countries uh you know we would look at times guides from a few years before this and There'd be one or two little things here and there, but as as a whole, it was just not a it was not a holiday park. And what right. you guys met, go ahead. That was that was the whole that was the whole point. It was bringing Christmas to Epcot. Um, so we did holiday illuminations. We brought in Don Dorsey um, and we programmed uh, holiday illuminations, and uh, we brought all the Santa Clauses to the different countries as well as the second year uh, talk about a hoop jump uh that's when we brought candlelight over from the magic kingdom 
and uh, probably one of the, the highest level approvals that I ever worked on. We had to go all the way to Eisner to get approval to move Candlelight from Magic Kingdom to Epcot. And then the second year after that, we added the um, dining package to it. Mm -hmm. It was kind of funny. Some folks didn't think that was going to really go over. Now I don't think you can even get into the show without the dining package. So, <laughs> Well, one of the things we noted was that when it was at the Magic Kingdom, I mean, originally it was done one night and then Correct. it was done over the course of a few nights. And then when you moved it into Epcot, I think it was a week or two that it was performed. And within a few years, it was up to four weeks. And now it's a now or something like that that it yeah absolutely is it, yeah uh, you know there was always conversations um because i did halloween as well and it was like okay you, you can't come in before october and now i think it starts in august <laughs> and the same thing with with the christmas uh it couldn't come in before december and now it comes in immediately after Halloween so the next, uh, the next morning yeah many conversations with marketing about when things could come and go and uh, so <laughs> it, it, interesting memories coming back can we go back to a technical thing you said you, you, you built them in house um, and you know Brian you talked about they said they were antiquated or old tech so obviously back then you didn't have the LEDs as you have today but were those C5, C9s, what did what kind of bulbs do you Yeah, C5s. They were C5s. Okay, so not as big as the, the C9s, but yeah, so each one of those pulling 15 watts or so. Um yeah, that's that's a that's a heavy duty heavy, heavy duty uh, electric bill for the night. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and getting the power to there as well, you know, there wasn't power to hook that all up to. So we had to bring power in. Um, and like I said, we had to dig up the plaza to put the footers in that could take all that weight. Wow. Well, that well, and then the uh, countries got their holiday overlay. So brought, you know, Christmas services in to come up with uh, all the decorations around the promenade and then what was appropriate to go into what country. So, you know, the merchandise shops you know, that was kind of the beginning of the heavy Christmas overlay to uh, any of the parks. Magic Kingdom, you know, had a little bit down Main Street, but it didn't go very far either. Um, Correct. So when I actually moved over to the Magic Kingdom, um, we did the whole uh, audio upgrade to the entire park so that you could watch the fireworks from multiple locations instead of just down Main Street. So we had to pump all the audio into all the facades. Um, so that was, you know, a, a ton of work. That was the beginning of <laughs> Christmas services going year round, basically to be able to tackle all the parks. And then when I went to Animal Kingdom, we did the same thing there. Brought the, designed the tree, Rhonda designed the tree out front. And then we brought the same thing decorations in and we overlaid Christmas onto the parade. Now you mentioned that you brought uh, the Osborne lights over to uh, Disney MGM Studios at the time and I unapologetically tell people now that the studios are no park does Christmas the way that the studios does. It's just it's, it's a delight from Hollywood and Sunset uh, and then what used to be back on the back lot um tell us about getting the call that you were getting jennings osborne's lights and <laughs> you needed to put them up on the back lot yeah he he uh made a call he was getting so much grief from all of his neighbors that had gotten you know it gotten so big and there was so much traffic and it's kind of this city <laughs> asked him to stop um but he he was a huge fan of walt disney world uh came all the time and uh he approached marketing this is the situation my family and i we love christmas and we would just like to donate this to you 
Um, and uh, semi trucks showed up with it all and we just had to figure out what to do with it all. Um, but then for, well, I was at the studio for six years. Uh, every year he would enhance it. Um, he would he would just buy more things, and you know, uh, John Phelan was the, the show director at the time, and so he and John got to be good friends, and uh, so every year they would, what else can we do? Um, so you know, same thing. It would start at the end of the summer and and start what what augmentations can we put out there and uh, get it all produced and get it loaded in. Uh, I forget what it was. Year two or three, we added the snow on um, the back lot. And that was a project in itself, figuring out how, because the, unfortunately there were no uh, industrial snow machines at the time. So after they ran for about a half hour, 45 minutes, they would burn out. So same thing, we brought our tech guys in and um, they, uh, figured out how to sync them up so that they would run in a series. So there was like four snow machines next to each other uh, and they would just run 15 minutes at a time and they would just cycle. <laughs> and then when I went to the Magic Kingdom, I brought I brought the snow to Main Street, same thing. I had to figure out how to get it up there on all those rooftops. But yeah, interesting projects over the years. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to start calling you Mr. Christmas because everything that we know about uh, the holidays in the parks now, you seem to have had a hand in. Yeah, I did, actually. Yeah, it's uh, It was a lot of fun. That's my favorite time of year. Um, so, yeah, love doing it. Do you still go over to the parks and to see them at the holidays? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we went this year. We were actually there on... Uh, what was it? New Year's? Two days before New Year's. Okay. Christmas week. Brave yep. man. Brave yep. man. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who did the artwork for the for the Lights of Winter? Who like to actually design the you know, the trellises and David David did the lighting programming. Um, but I don't know. It was probably either Cindy White or Rhonda. Okay. One of, one of the two of them uh, were were the main uh, designers at the time. So you know, Ron had brought pictures back from Tivoli, and we just replicated it ba based on the dimensions we had to work with there. Yeah, hey, it's it's so funny. It's amazing. I never linked it to Tivoli, but the one you say it, I'm just like, oh yeah, duh. <laughs> it just makes so so much sense. In fact, I'm looking up the pictures of Tivoli because I love. <laughs> Yeah, they've got all the arches and stuff. I started a Hunchback, and then Ron wanted me to move over and do uh, Fantasmic the, the first time. Okay. Um, and then did all the parades for years, uh, starting with the Muppets, Aladdin, Mulan, uh, stars and cars. I was going to say, did you do the superstars and motor cars? I missed that one just because of the classic cars. That was yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and then at, right when that one was in towards the end of production, uh, I moved over to Animal Kingdom and <laughs> had the wonderful joy of trying to figure out how to put a parade in Animal Kingdom when it was designed not to have a parade. <laughs> Uh, that Christmas we did the holiday overlay to that. Um, but what else? Disney's Doug. Doug live on stage, yeah. Yeah. Worked on all the big press events. But enclosed Lion King at um, Animal Kingdom. When that first opened, it was like an outdoor. And... Uh, so we enclosed that and brought really enhanced the show once you got lighting in it. Mm -hmm. I had to bring the VPs out and run it at night to show them the difference of what lighting would bring to the show. Um, and so they approved the funding to enclose it. 
And then we put the roof on uh, the Backlot Theater while I was there and then started the project of enclosing, um, well, it's, it, oh, it, where Nemo is now. We enclosed right. that building as well. The only one I didn't convince them to enclose was um, Beauty and the Beast. Okay. That, that was in two separate spots. They they had that in that original, um, what was it, the clamshell? The, the band yeah. shell, rather? Yep. And then you guys built the, at the end of Sunset, right? Sunset, and yep. Uh-huh. You built the special stage, and it's still running, right? I think it's... Yeah, uh, yeah. Back up and running. Yeah, we were, so. Like I said, we were just there. Can you give us your best Ron Logan story? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Every, everybody's got one. Oh. Probably the most... <laughs> Interesting one was, uh, oh, my mind just went blank. The head of marketing at the time, um, he had a fascination. He wanted an ice show. Okay. At the studio. And so I went to all these different ice show companies at the time. Um, and they were like, you understand this is outdoor in Florida, right? All, all of our systems are designed to be, you know, in coliseums or, you know, whatever. And uh, so so to do it, it was going to be so expensive. Tom Elrod just came back to me. Okay. Uh, so we had a big meeting um, when we were up there at, uh, on Republic Plaza in the entertainment offices. <laughs> And so, you know, I've made the case that this is what it was going to cost, and we're going to have to find some place and move it indoors. So, you know, the rough numbers, it was going to be like $5 million to pull off an ice show. Um, and so the meeting abruptly ended, and Tom called Ron out into the hallway. <laughs> and uh, I guess they had a few words and Ron, Ron came back into the meeting and he looks over at my boss at the time and he some people are paid to talk and some people are paid to sit there and listen and he got up and he stormed out <laughs> do, you, do you have a Dick Nunes story Dick was always great he was fond of he was very fond of entertainment when we tried to get Fantasmic mounted for the third time, you know, he, he went to bat. That's back. Justin did the final approval. Um, Bruce Laval wanted it so badly. He thought that was going to, you know, kind of tip the scales for getting studio to be, you know, full time like the Magic Kingdom and Epcot were because um, we weren't always open full time like the other parks were. Uh, so he uh he kind of put his career on the line to get that one it was, it was some interesting politics between us and disneyland how how we did business at the time so that's that was the biggest challenge getting the performer to work because so much of the disneyland phantasmic was done on the maintenance budget it wasn't a project budget and so we could never get the math um, and, and and the fact that they had the the uh, paddle boat and they had the, the the ship didn't help things either. And plus, they had the river. Right, you had to build I, all that. Yeah, yeah. I I moved I moved the parade compound three times while I was there. Uh, yeah, Fantasmic sits in the in the parking lot, the cast member parking lot. And finally, I instead of the Quonsonuts, I was able to get an actual building for the poor parade maintenance guys <laughs> the, the last time I moved it. People who shuttle between the coast are like, oh, the Disneyland show's better. It's got this, it's got that. And um, I doubt that they appreciate the constraints you were working under trying to bring it to Florida at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, that, that was a tough one. Like I said, I started and shut it down three different times. Finally, the third time it got 
it got approved. Go ahead, One of the more unique moments when we were doing the Muppet Parade, Jim Henson was in all the concept meetings. And I'm the one that got the call the morning after he had passed. That was around, I had to go into Ron's office. Uh, I just, you're not going to believe this, but I just got a phone call from his assistant saying that he had passed in the middle of the night. Um, so yeah, we had to figure out what to do. Had to get with the family to see if we wanted to move forward or if we were just going to shut it down. Yeah, that was one of my more wackier studio stories this couple would literally come every day to watch the show and they would sit down front and the wife had a big handbag if you will with her stuffed dead dog in it and they knew the cast by name one day i get this call I happened to be duty manager that day. And uh, the husband decided to go out and take a nap in the car. And somebody came by and thought he was dead. <laughs> had to run out there and he about had a heart attack when we tapped on the window and woke him up. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A locked car in Florida. It's not the place to take a nap. But Yeah, exactly. So yeah, lots of stories over 20 years. Looking back, I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one more story. I'll, I'll never forget it as long as I live. Um, it was opening day of Voyage of the Little Mermaid, and I was sitting in the back row, and uh, you know the laser sheet scan went off, and the cloud, the curtain opened, and out comes Ariel on her little platform, and there was a family in front of me. And the little girl reached over to mom. She said, see, mommy, I told you she was real. So uh, it's it's heartwarming to think of all those kind of magical moments created for, you know, millions of guests over the years. Yeah, that's got to be a rewarding, rewarding thing to listen to. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, that was, I'll never forget that one. Which is how we ended up with Billy Flanagan opening our second day last last year. When oh yeah, coming out yeah. to re recreate uh, some of his opening day Epcot stuff that he did in 1982. Yeah, when I first came to Disney, I was the stage manager at Pioneer Hall, and and Billy was in that show. We, yeah, we've been friends for a long time. Oh, what a guy! Yeah, he's got a resume and. Still can dance and sing. <laughs> yeah, he can. He never ages. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we just, we went to the premiere of his movie. Yeah, he was, he was responsible for my fiance, um, adopted her daughters. And he was the one that hooked her up to the people that she adopted her first daughter from. Wow. Good news follows that guy everywhere. Yep. <laughs> he's a, he's a great guy. Really is. He's, Makes me laugh. Well, listen, I appreciate your time tonight. Todd, anything you have before we let this man go? No, I think that's that's all I've got. So I super appreciate your time. And as, as Brian said, as we get closer to, you know, things in the future and uh, see what we do and meet some of your fans that you didn't know you had. Yeah, that awesome. you didn't know you awesome. had. That'd be great. All right. I appreciate it, guys. All right. Thank Thanks you so a lot, much. James. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Have a great evening. You, you too. too. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Follow the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society on Twitter and Instagram at LBV History and on the web at lbvhistory.org. For all things Retro Disney World, including exclusive merchandise, visit us on the web at retrowdw.com and on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at retrowdw. And follow our hosts, Todd McCartney, on Twitter at wdwms, Hal Bowers on Twitter and Instagram at goawaygreen. JT Couser on Twitter at LS1JT and on YouTube at Rubber City Motoring and on the web at RubberCityMotoring.com. And you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Brian P. Miles. 
Retro Disney World is the monthly podcast of the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society, a nonpartisan, nonprofit, tax exempt 501c3 organization, and is not affiliated in any way with the Walt Disney Corporation or any of its subsidiary or affiliated entities.